Welcome to Lecture 15 of How to Read and Do Proofs. Welcome back, everybody. This is our last lecture of the series. Now that you've learned all of the proof techniques, what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes reviewing with you these different proof techniques, how to use them and when to use them. And then what I'd like to do is bring all of your knowledge of these techniques together with a final example of how to read a proof. So let's start with a summary of the different proof techniques. First and foremost, the forward-backward method. This is the single most important proof technique because if you understand this technique, all of the other proof techniques can be explained in terms of the forward-backward method. And as you will recall, with the forward-backward method, you can assume that the hypothesis A is true. Your job is to show that the conclusion B is true. And the way you do that is with the forward process and the backward process. In the forward process, you start with the assumption that A is true, and you create from A other statements that are necessarily true, A1, A2, A3. In the backward process, you look at the statement B that you're trying to show is true, and you need to learn to ask the key question. How can I show that two real numbers are equal, two triangles are congruent, a matrix is non-singular, two lines are parallel, whatever the appropriate key question is? You need to learn to ask the key question and then answer the key question. Very often, we'll use a definition to answer the key question. You can use previous knowledge to answer a key question. That's an art. But in any case, the result of the backward process is a new statement, B1, with the property that if B1 is true, then so is B. And now you can work backward from B1 to B2, from B2 to B3. Keeping in mind that the whole purpose of the forward-backward method is to generate, in the forward process, a statement that is precisely the same as the last statement in the backward process. And then you will have complete, completed the proof with the forward-backward method. In addition to the forward-backward method, then we learned our three quantifier proof techniques, the construction method, the choose method, and the specialization method. So let's take a moment to review these. First, the, the proof techniques associated with the keywords there is. When you see the keywords there is in the forward process, you know that there is an object with a certain property such that something happens and you simply use that object with its properties to create more true statements in the forward process. That is so straightforward that we don't have a special proof technique to do that. In contrast, however, if you come across the keywords there is in the backward process, then it's your job to show that there is an object with a certain property such that something happens. And how can you show that there is an object with a certain property such that something happens? You can construct an object with a certain property and prove that something happens? Yes, use the construction method. Go out and construct the object. A couple of comments about constructing the object. It's an art, but as guidelines, I can suggest that what you do is turn to the forward process, use the information in the hypothesis to help you construct the object. You can also look at the properties that the object is supposed to satisfy and play with those properties to see if you can construct an object with those properties. In any case, with the construction method, please remember, constructing the object by itself is not the proof. The proof, con con the proof consists of showing that the object you constructed is in fact the correct one, meaning that the object you constructed satisfies the certain property in the something that happens. Okay. Turning to the quantifier for all, when you see those keywords in the backward process, it's your job to show that for every object with a certain property, something happens. Now, we don't have time to list all the objects with a certain property and show that the something happens. That takes too much work. So we created the choose method to help us get around that problem. And with the choose method, what you do is you choose one general object with the certain property. That becomes information in the forward process because you chose it. Here it is. You can use it. Your job is to show that for that chosen object, the something happens. Now you work forward from the chosen object with its certain property. 
to show that the something happens from which you can work backward. And that model proof completes the choose method. In contrast, when you see the keywords for all in the forward process, now you know that for every object with a certain property something happens. How do you work forward from that kind of a statement? How do you work forward from a statement of the form for every object with a certain property something happens? The answer is specialization. What you try to do is specialize that for all statement to one particular object with the certain property. So what you try to do is find one particular object with the certain property and as a result of specialization you can conclude as a new statement in the forward process that for that object the something happens. And writing down that the something happens for that particular object is the result of specialization. So those are our three quantifier proof techniques. Then we learned the contradiction method. With the contradiction method for showing that A implies B is true, you, s you try to rule out the one case when A implies B is false. And that one case is when A is true and B is false. So with the contradiction method, we rule out that one case when A implies B is false. And if we can rule it out, then A implies B has to be true. How do we rule out the one case when A implies B is false? We assume that A is true and B is false and show that that cannot happen. What does that mean to show that that cannot happen? We simply work forward from A and not B to reach a contradiction. The contradiction is the reason that it cannot be that A is true and B is false at the same time. And that contradiction rules out row two of the truth table. The time to use the contradiction method is when you see the keywords no or not in the conclusion or anywhere in the backward process. That's the time you want to think about the contradiction method. Now one of the disadvantages of the contradiction method is that as you are working forward from A and not B, you're trying to reach a contradiction, but you don't know what that contradiction is going to be. So when you're using a proof by contradiction, you cannot work backward because you don't know what the contradiction is, so you don't know from where to work backward. And because of that, we have a new proof technique, the contrapositive method, which is a proof by contradiction in which you try to reach the specific contradiction that A is both true and not true at the same time. In particular, the way the contrapositive method works is you assume A is true and B is not true, and you work forward from not B to show that not A is true. How can A be true and not true at the same time? That's a contradiction. More simply stated, with the contrapositive method, you work forward from not B and backward from not A. And that's the advantage of the contrapositive method. Because you know you're trying to show that A is not true, you can work backward from not A. Again, because the contrapositive method is a proof by contradiction, you should think about using the contrapositive method when the conclusion contains the keywords no or not. And even more so when the hypothesis also contains the keywords no or not. Then you're likely to find that the contrapositive method is very effective. Then we looked at the uniqueness methods. These are methods which are associated with the keywords unique or one and only one, which go with the quantifier there is. There is one and only one object with a certain property such that something happens. There is a unique object with a certain property such that something happens. Those keywords can appear in either the forward process or the backward process. So we have two different proof techniques, a forward uniqueness method and a backward uniqueness method. In either case, with the uniqueness methods, in the backward process, the first thing you have to do is you have to show that there is an object with a certain property such that something happens. Construct it, for example. Go out and construct an object with a certain property for which the something happens. Then you can deal with the uniqueness. And how do you show that there's only one such object? Well, again, suppose you have created this object X already with a certain property and for which the something happens. There are two ways to show that X is unique. X is the only one. One is to assume that Y is also an object with a certain property and for, 
for which the something happens. Now, if x is really unique, and y is also an object with a certain property for which the something happens, what should be the relationship between y and x? They should be? The same. The same. And that means you have to show that they're the same. So you can assume that x is, you, first you construct the object x with a certain property and for which the something happens. Then you can assume that y is also an object with a certain property and for which the something happens. Your job is to show that they're the same. Okay. The other way to show that uh, the object x is unique is to assume that y is a different object with the certain property and for which the something happens. Now that shouldn't be allowed to happen, right? If x is unique, there should not be another object y different from x for which the certain property and the something happens. How do you rule that out? You reach a contradiction. So that's the other backward uniqueness method. In the forward uniqueness method, you look for two objects with a certain property and for which the something happens. And because you know that the object is unique, these two objects have to be the same. Writing that they are the same as a forward step is the forward uniqueness method. So those are our uniqueness methods. Then we looked at mathematical induction, a special quantifier proof technique. You should use the induction method when you want to show that for every integer n bigger than or equal to some initial integer, some statement p of n is true. So the keywords to look for are integer, obviously for all, and integer bigger than or equal to some initial value. And how does induction work? It's a proof machine. It works in two steps. To get the proof machine started, you have to show that the statement is true for the very first possible value of the integer. After you do step one, step two is to assume that the statement is true for n and prove that the statement is automatically going to be true for n plus one. And how do you do that? The key is to look at the statement for n plus one and try to relate it back to the statement for n. Find a relationship between the statement for n plus 1 and the statement for n. If you cannot find that linking relationship, induction is not likely to be successful. So that's the key to mathematical induction. Then we looked at those either or methods. And of course, we use those methods when you see the keywords either or in the forward process or in the backward process. And correspondingly, we have two different proof techniques. When you see the keywords either or in the forward process, for example, if you want to show that if C or D is true, then B is true, what you need to do is a proof by cases. Because you do not know if it's C that's true or it's D that's true, let's do two proofs. Case one, assume that C is true and show that B is true. Case two, assume that D is true and show that B is true. Once you've done those two proofs, now it no longer matters whether it's C that's true or it's D that's true. If it's C that's true, we're going to use the proof in case one. And if it's D that happens to be true, we're going to use the proof in case two. So that's a proof by cases. Use that when you see the keywords either or in the forward process. When you see the keywords either or in the backward process, for example, if you want to show that if A is true, then either C is true or D is true, what we do is we assume A is true, and we assume C is not true. So now we've got A being true and C false, and we work forward from that to show that D must be true. Alternatively, you can assume that A is true and D is not true, and then show that C is true. That's what we call a proof by elimination. Those are our either or methods. And finally, in lecture 14, you saw the max-min methods. Use these methods when you see the keywords max or min in relation to the minimum and maximum of a set of real numbers. The whole idea of the min-max method is to convert the min-max statement into an equivalent statement that contains a quantifier. Because once you have a quantifier, whether it's there is or for all, you can then use the construction, choose, or specialization methods. And that's a complete list of our proof techniques. 
what we want to do now is take a final example of how to read a proof that will use a large number of these different proof techniques. Now this example that I'm going to give you deals with the maximum and minimum of the set. However, some sets of real numbers do not have a largest or smallest element. For example, let's look at this set right here. The set of real numbers, s, for which s is strictly bigger than 0 and strictly less than 1. As you can see here, there is no largest element in this set, right? Because it doesn't include 0 and it doesn't include 1. So we don't have a largest or smallest element. Let's talk about the natural numbers. The natural numbers are the positive integers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on, the counting numbers. An interesting question is, when does a subset of the natural numbers have a least element, a smallest element? We're going to look at an axiom that ensures that a subset of the natural numbers has a least element. And this is called the least integer principle. The least integer principle says that every non-empty set of natural numbers has a smallest element. That is, for any non-empty set of the natural numbers, there is an element y in the set such that every other element in the set is bigger than that y. y is the smallest member of the set. Now let me remind you that an axiom is a statement that we assume is true without having to do a proof. So we are going to assume that this statement is true. That's like a forward statement. Every non-empty set of positive integers has a least element. And because of the keywords for every in the forward process, what you should think about or be aware of is that to make use of this least integer principle, that is to work forward from here, we're going to use specialization. Let's take a look at the proposition that we want to prove. If x is less than y are positive real numbers, then there is a rational number r such that r is between x and y. Before I show you the proof, what I urge you to learn to do with propositions is stop for a moment and think about what they're saying. What is this proposition telling you in words? That for any two numbers, there's always a number in between them. What this proposition is telling us is that if we have two different real numbers, positive in this case, x less than y, no matter how close they are together, we can always squeeze in a rational number between x and y. Okay, now I'm going to show you a written proof of this proposition. But before I do that, I'd like you to think a little bit about how you would prove this proposition yourself. So, of course, you've identified the hypothesis A and the conclusion B. What's the next step in doing a proof? Pick a method. Choose a proof technique. Look at this proposition. Can you tell me what proof technique you would use to begin this proof? And why? The construction method. The construction method is correct. Why is that, Laurel? Of the there is in the backward statement. Exactly. Recognizing the keywords there is in the backward process, you, I hope, would decide to use the construction method. And with the construction method, what you would have to do is construct a rational number, r, and then show that it is between x and y, correct? Keeping that in mind, let me now show you the written proof and see if you can figure out what the author has done. Our goal is to explain each of these sentences in the context of proof techniques.
OK, now before we actually get into the details of reading this proof, let's go back to what we said before we started, namely that because of the keywords there is in the backward process here in the conclusion, we would use the construction method, and the hope is that the author has done the same thing. In fact, the hope is that the author has constructed a rational number r for which r is between x and y. Indeed, that is what the author has done. Can somebody tell me where in this proof the author constructs the value of r? In sentence 8? In S8, exactly. Right there it says, so r is equal to, remember what r is supposed to be, a fraction? m over n. What are m and n? What kind of mathematical objects? Integers. Good. Integers. OK, so now the question is, where do m and n come from? If you understand that this is the construction of r, then somewhere in this proof the author must construct a value for m and a value for n. Indeed, if you read S1, there is the value of n. Let n be a positive integer for which this happens. So this is the value of n somehow. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. Can somebody tell me where does the author construct the value of m? S3. In S3, exactly. It is clear that all of this happens. T has a least element, say m. There is m. m is, in fact, the least element of this set P. So now we have the big picture. This is a proof by the construction method. The author is going to construct a rational number r for which r is between x and y. The construction of r is down here in S8. It's r equals some integer m divided by some integer n. And the integer n is given up here in S1. And the integer m is given here in S3. And what I assume is that the rest of this proof is somehow related to showing that the value that you construct is the correct one, namely that r is between x and y. The rest of what we're going to do is fill in all the details of understanding S1 through S8 in the context of proof techniques. So let's get started. Again, you've identified the hypothesis A, x less than y are positive real numbers, and the conclusion B, there is a rational number r for which r is between x and y. And now let's look at what the author says in statement S1. Let n be a positive integer for which n times y minus x is strictly bigger than 1. OK, so again, what proof technique is the author using? We've already discussed this, so we know it's the construction method. And that's because of the keywords there is in the backward process. In fact, if you look back at the proof, as we said, it's in S8 that the author says, so r is equal to m over n, and that satisfies the fact that r is between x and y. Evidently, the value of n is constructed right here in the statement S1. Let n be a positive integer such that n times y minus x is bigger than 1. So what we need to do is, first of all, ask the question, is that true? Is there such an n? Well, what do we know about x and y? They're positive real numbers. They're positive real numbers, and? x is less than y. And x is less than y. So what about y minus x? What do we know about y minus x? It's positive. It's positive. So this is a positive number. For example, suppose this is 0.1. Is there an integer n for which n times 0.1 is bigger than 1? Yes. What value of n would make n times 0.1 bigger than 1? Uh, anything greater than 10. Anything greater than 10, exactly. What the author is claiming is that we can find an integer n for which n times y minus x is greater than 1. So the answer is yes. Now, why you want to use that particular value of n is not yet clear, but it should be related to showing that when we're all done, the value of r equals m over n is between x and y. That's what it should be related to. Now we need the numerator m. And as we discussed earlier, where does the author construct the integer m? If you look back at the proof, as we said, it's in S3. And it turns out that in S3, the author says that m is the least integer of some set t. So the author's probably going to give us a set t and then find the least integer of that set, and that will be m. Here's where we are. These are our forward statements. We already have the, constructed the value of the integer n. We know that we're going to have to produce the, the numerator m. Now the author writes S2. Now consider the set t of integers k strictly positive such that k is bigger than n times x. 
Okay, so the author is creating a set of positive integers, and we know the purpose of this set. What is the purpose of this set? The author is going to do what to this set? Find the minimum, the least element, exactly. And that will be the numerator m in the fraction r. The author is constructing a set of integers whose smallest integer m will be the numerator of the rational number. Now the question that we have to ask is, how do we know this set has a least element? And this is where we want to use the least integer principle. So let me remind you what the least integer principle tells us. This is an axiom which we assume is true, namely that every non-empty set of positive integers has a least element. And if we're going to make use of this kind of a statement based on key words, what proof technique would you use to work forward from this kind of a statement? Specialization. Specialization. And that's exactly what the author is going to do. The author is going to specialize this least integer principle to one particular non-empty set of positive integers. If you want to apply specialization to the set T, you have to know what about it? That it is? Non-empty. Non-empty. And contains positive integers. And contains positive integers. Well, let's look at the set T up here, where it's defined. What is T defined as? The set of what kinds of integers? Positive integers. Positive integers. So already we know that we have a set of positive integers. The only thing we have left to check is that it is non-empty. Is there a positive integer K for which K is bigger than NX? Yes. Yes. Whatever this number is, 348.789, you can find something that is bigger than that. So we now know that T is a non-empty set of positive integers. And that means we can specialize the least integer principle to this particular set T. Can somebody tell me what is the result of specialization? That the set has a least smallest element? That the set has the least element. And that is exactly the new forward statement that we can write. By specialization, that is uh, specializing the least integer principle to this non-empty set of positive integers, the result of specialization is that the something happens. T has a least element. And now you can understand the statement S3. Let's look at S3. The author writes, it is clear that T is non-empty, and we know that it's positive integers, and so by the least integer principle, what the author really means is by specializing the least integer principle, we can claim that T has a least element, say, M. That's a new forward statement. So now, notice, the author has constructed the numerator M for the rational number R and the denominator N for the rational number R. So R is M over N. And so the author has constructed the rational number. Is the proof complete? Are we done? No. No, why not? Uh, you have to show that the something happens. You have to show that the object you construct is the correct one, namely that it satisfies the certain property and the something that happens. In particular, we still have to show that R equals M over N is between X and Y. So we construct the rational number R equals M over N, and we're not finished because we still have to show that this constructed object is correct. That is that r equals m over n is strictly between x and y. And that's what the remaining statements in this written proof are all about. Let's take a look. To show that m over n is between x and y, let's simply bring the n up on both sides here. So n times x has to be less than m, less than n times y. We have to show that m is strictly between nx and ny. If we can show that this is true, divide both sides by n, and you'll get m over n is strictly bigger than x and strictly less than y. So this is what the author is going to show next. Here's where we are. This is what the author has to show to complete the proof. And now let's see what the author writes in S4. The author says, now m is an element of t, so m is bigger than nx, and it will be shown that m is less than ny. So let's see if we can understand this. Look at B1. We have to show two things here. m is bigger than nx, and m is less than ny. And that's exactly what the author is saying. The author is saying m is, in fact, bigger than nx, and it still has to be shown that m is less than ny. Let's understand, why is m bigger than nx? Well, it says 
Now m is in t. So first of all, why is m in t? What is m? m is the least element in t. m is the least element in t, so it is in t, correct? Look at the definition of t. If m is in that set, what property does m satisfy? m has to be? Greater than n times x. Bigger than n times x, and that's exactly what the author is writing here. m is bigger than n times x because m is in this set. And that gives us already this strict inequality here. Then the author says we still have to show that m is less than ny. And so again, the rest of the proof, I hope, is oriented around showing that m is less than ny. Here's where we are. In S5, the author says, suppose to the contrary that m is bigger than or equal to ny, which is bigger than 1 plus nx, which is bigger than 1. So what do you think this assume to the contrary means? What proof technique is the author using here? The contradiction method. The contradiction method. The author is going to show that m is less than ny by contradiction. And if you remember how contradiction works, you should assume the opposite. And what's the opposite of m less than ny? That m is equal to or greater than ny. m is greater than or equal to ny. And that's exactly what the author is assuming. And again, remember how the contradiction method works? You assume the opposite of what you want, and then what do you have to do? Show a contradiction. Reach a contradiction. So here's what I want to do. I want to go back to the written proof and see if you can identify where the contradiction is. Take a moment, please, to look at this written proof and see if you can identify what the contradiction is. Okay, who found the contradiction? That m minus 1 is in set t when m is supposed to be the least element. Right. In S6, the author is claiming, now we don't know that this is true yet, but the author is claiming in S6 that m minus 1 is in t. If m is the smallest element, m minus 1 cannot be in that set. And yet the author is claiming that m minus 1 is in the set. That, in fact, is the contradiction. So now what we need to do is read through the rest of the proof to be sure that the author is correct, namely that m minus 1 is in t. Now let's go back to S5 here. Suppose to the contrary that m is bigger than or equal to ny. That's the opposite of what the author wants to show. Now the author also says that ny is bigger than 1 plus nx, which is bigger than 1. The question is, first of all, is that true? And then ultimately, who cares? So let's first check if that is true. Do we know that n times y is bigger than 1 plus nx? The author is starting to show that m minus 1 is in t. That's the goal, right? And let's look at t. If you want m minus 1 to be in t, what do you need to know about m minus 1? That it's a positive integer. That m minus 1 has to be a positive integer and greater than n times x. n minus 1 has to be greater than n times x. That's what we have to show in order for m minus 1 to be in the set. And that's what this is about. To check what the author is writing here to see that that's correct, let's go forward from a1. Remember, n is a positive integer for which n times y minus x is bigger than 1. Let's multiply through by n and add nx to both sides then you get n times y is strictly bigger than 1 plus nx, and that's exactly what the author has written here. n times y is strictly bigger than 1 plus nx. So this inequality comes from a1 by working forward, and then the author claims that that's bigger than 1 because n is positive and x is positive, so this whole thing is positive. So 1 plus a positive number is always bigger than 1. So these inequalities are correct. And why is the author generating these inequalities? To show that m minus 1 is in t. That's the goal. So here's where we are. In other words, the author is trying to show that this is true. 
and by contradiction assumes the opposite, and then uses this statement A1 to claim that Ny is bigger than 1 plus Nx. N and X are positive, so that's bigger than 1. And all of that is used to show that M minus 1 is in T. So let's see how does the author convince us that M minus 1 is in T. Well, again, recall that what we have to show is that M minus 1 is positive and M minus 1 is bigger than NX, correct? Well, look at this string of inequalities and simply subtract 1 from everybody here. What do you get here? M minus 1. Greater than or equal to NY minus 1. Greater than what? NX. NX greater than? Zero. Zero. Exactly. So let's subtract 1 from everybody. And notice what this is now saying. M minus 1 is positive. That's the first part. And the second part, M minus 1 is bigger than NX. There's the second part. And that means that M minus 1 is in T. And so the author is indeed correct. Now we know that m minus 1 is in t, and that, in fact, is a contradiction. And that's what the author says. The fact that m minus 1 is less than m contradicts m being the least element of t. How can m minus 1 be in t when m is supposed to be the smallest element, and m minus 1 is even smaller? That contradiction establishes that m is less than n minus y. And so, we now have the forward statement m is less than n minus y. This completes the proof because a5 is exactly the same as b1. And that's the end of this proof. We now know that a proof is a convincing argument expressed in the language of mathematics that the statement a implies b is true. And this language of mathematics are the proof techniques that you have learned. Every proof I have ever seen can be explained as a sequence of applications of the proof techniques. When you read a proof, what you have to learn to do is identify which proof techniques the author is using and how they are being applied. Because unfortunately, as you saw in our last example, the author did not mention any of the varied proof techniques that were used. The construction method, specialization, contradiction, they're all there but you have to figure out which one is being used. When you do a proof yourself, I hope you will keep in mind that the first step is to identify the hypothesis A and the conclusion B. The second step is to consciously choose a proof technique. And how do you choose a proof technique? Look for keywords. Look for keywords in the hypothesis and or the conclusion. What keywords? There is, for all either or, max, min, no, and not, uniqueness. These are examples of keywords. If you don't see any keywords, then what should you do? Just use the forward-backward method. Just use the forward-backward method to get started. As you proceed through the proof, the statements that you are currently working with in the forward process and the backward process, look for keywords to help guide you in terms of what proof technique to use. Your goal should be to become as fluent in this new language as you can. This will facilitate your ability to do proofs. So again, I hope you now appreciate that a proof, in fact, is a convincing argument expressed in the language of mathematics, that is, a sequence of proof techniques, that the statement A implies B is true. I wish you good luck with your new language. That completes this lecture.